All right, good morning everyone. This is Jeff Scott of Rankin Technical College and we're about to start day 13 of the online AWD 1100 C-sharp programming class for the summer 2023 semester. I wanted to mention as we first start, if you didn't know it, um, Rankin Technical College does have a counselor that you can talk to if you need help with anything, if you fall behind, if you're having personal problems or whatever. Her name is Stacy uh, uh, Abels Williams, and um, she comes to the Rankin campus typically once or twice a week. She will be there today and so you see that this is her email address right here, and I guess I dropped off the U. All right, so that's her email address, and her phone number is 314-286-4845. Now, you may never have a reason to contact her, but you may. All right, she's there to help. All right. I will tell you that the biggest problem that we seem to have during the summer semester is trying to get people who want to come in and act as tutors, online tutors for people who are having problems. If you're in this class and you think you're doing really well and you have an understanding of what's going on and you're interested in possibly tutoring, send me an email. Let me know. If you need a tutor, it is your responsibility to email me as soon as possible and let me know. All right. There is no cost if you need a tutor. And if you want to be a tutor, there's paperwork and stuff that you have to fill out and I can get all that to you. But you get $10 an hour. It's not a, not a terrific amount. And they ask that you tutor no more than like 20 hours a week. But it'd be a way for you to pick up a few bucks, I guess during the um, summer semester. Now, I'm almost all caught up on grading. Just so you know, I'm almost all caught up. Everyone's test is graded. Uh, everyone's written tests are graded, and just about all of the homeworks are graded. So if you go out to insiderankin.org, you should see, pretty much, you should see an up-to-date listing now if you've got zeros in there that means in as far as i can tell you didn't turn something in and what i tried to do this morning was to send out emails to those of you who are behind all right or who have fallen behind or who have assignments missing again i'm not totally done grading i will finish up this afternoon all right so with all that said Get rid of that and that and bring up this. There we go. All right. So again, today is day 13. As it says, we are first going to go over chapter eight, which is on arrays and collections in our textbooks, textbook rather. Next, we will go over selected problems from chapter seven and eight. For those of you who yesterday watched the entire taping, thank you. It's much appreciated because it went a lot longer than I thought it would. I um, lectured from eight to noon, and then I knew that it was really from eight till 11.55 that the tape takes off and starts again at 12. So I took a five minute break, and then I went from about noon Till about 1.15. So there's about five hours and 15 minutes of tape yesterday. It won't be nearly as long today. I would imagine we'll be done by noon. We'll see how it goes. All right. I'm probably going to break this up into two tapes today. And the reason for that is the first part, this I'm going to make public. I'll put this out on my YouTube channel. All right, and I will send you the URL. This, I'm gonna actually be going through some of your homework, all right, and that will be private. I did this to you once before where I sent you out a private or an invite to a private video. Again, all right, so I will literally stop taping. We'll take a break after we get done with chapter eight 
and then I'll start up again. OK, hopefully that makes at least a little bit of sense to you. All right, so tomorrow I'm going to hand out by I really email you by 7 a.m. The uh, the pretest for chapters seven and eight. I will go over the directions for the pretest from about 8 a.m. until 8.15 a.m. Then you will get from 8.15 a.m. until 10 a.m. to complete the pretest. All right. And at 10 a.m., I will go over and do the pretest for you from scratch. Okay. All right. Then Thursday will be your next hands on test hot number three. Again, you will be email that hands on test by no later than. Um, 7 a.m. I will again go over the instructions for the test from 8 a.m. until 8.15 a.m. And as always, you'll have until midnight. All right now, the last thing I want to put the remembers here. Some of you are falling behind. I don't want to see that any more than you want to see that. Your chapters four through six, written tests and homework. There really were no labs. I don't know why I keep that on there, but I do. But your chapters four through six, written tests and homework were due last Sunday. So if you turn anything in late, you're probably going to get docked with some kind of a penalty now because you've been told. Your chapter eight, written tests, so the written test for seven, the written test for eight, your homework and your homework for seven and eight are seven, one, seven, two, eight, one, and eight, two. We'll look at some of those a little bit later today. All right, and then finally your lab or chapter seven and eight is project two, two. All right, that's what's due on Sunday of this week. A couple people had emailed me, said they weren't sure exactly what was due this week. That's it. All right, so with all that said, let me jump right into chapter eight in our text. So, we have completed, let me just back up for a second. We have completed the first seven chapters of the book. I'm not reading any of those to you. You can see them. Yesterday, I gave a lecture, a very extended lecture, where I. Different. And then I also wrote one GUI application where I took the last console app, turned it into a GUI app, and did that as well. That was kind of a prelude to this chapter. So we're going to talk about arrays and we're going to talk about collections today. Next week, we will go over chapters 9, 10, and 11. OK, now just so you know, I'm not going to give you any homework. I'm, I, let me say that again. I, I'm wrong. Um, for next week, when you take your test, you're, you're debugging all the time when you're writing programs. So your test, really, your hands-on test, your last one in this section, will be basically on 9 and 10. All right? So with that said, let's jump into Chapter 8. Not a particularly short chapter, just so you know. It's about 45 pages. All right, as I mentioned to you yesterday, an array is basically a container. I'm not going to go back over all that I went over yesterday. I just don't want to waste your time doing something like that. OK, so like I said, I'm not I'm not going to. All right, but we have we have talked a little bit now about what arrays are. They are basically a container. Now, one thing that differentiates arrays in C sharp as opposed to arrays in JavaScript that we looked at those of you who are in the AWD 1000 class, Web Development Technologies last semester, I'm going to put a couple terms up here that may not make a whole boatload of sense to you. All right, just but just so you know. And that is something that is. Early binded versus something that is late. 
bind it. All right. All right, an example of something that's early binded are arrays in C sharp. An example of something that is late binded are arrays in JavaScript. Why am I even taking the time to mention this to you? When something is early binded, that means it is set at compile time. I'm going to explain what all this is in just a minute. When something is late binded, it is set at runtime. So what does all this stuff mean? This means that when you create an array in C sharp, when you create an array in C sharp, boom, you cannot change the size of the array. All right. Once the program starts running. It's set when the program is compiled. So if you say an array has 10 elements, that's all it has. You can't add elements to it. You can't remove elements from it because it's set at compile time before the program actually runs. On the other hand, in JavaScript that we went over last semester, you can, C-A-N, you can change the size of the array. In other words, add things to it, remove things from it. You can do that in JavaScript. Since it's set runtime, that means while the program's running, you can change it. So why am I taking the time again to tell you this? All right. Because what we're about to talk about is not only arrays in C sharp, but we're also going to talk about collections in C sharp and mainly things like lists. And as you notice right there, collections in C sharp are late binded, which means that as the program is running, you can add things to a collection like a list, remove things from a collection like a list. All right. The other thing that I wanted to quickly mention, this has nothing to do with late binding or early binding, but when we used arrays in JavaScript last semester, you could combine element types. In other words, in JavaScript, you can have an array and the stuff that's inside of the array, known as the array elements, they, you could have, for example, a string, all right, and then in your next element could be a number, then your next element could be a Boolean, etc. That's not how it works in C sharp. So arrays in C sharp, all elements must be of the same data type. All right, and I'm just giving you a couple, not specifics, but just going over some of the stuff so we can start differentiating between arrays in C sharp and arrays in JavaScript. What that means is in C sharp, let's just say I'm going to make an array of grades. So I come in here and I say int bracket bracket. All right. And I say grades <clears throat> equal new int, and I say that there's 10. All right. What that means is I'm going to have 10 grades in there. And really, what is in there are going to be grades zero. So I could, for example, set that equal to 100. All right. Let me just copy in 10 of them because I want you to see this. All right, one, two, oops, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine. And let's suppose it's a typical kind of class. So let's say the next person got a 90, the person after that got an 81. 
the next person got a 78, the person after that got an 89, then a 93, a 67, next person didn't take the test, somebody got a 98, and finally an 88. So what I'm showing you here <clears throat> is after I create an array, how I can go in and set up values for the array. If I don't do this, all right, if I don't give these values, if I don't give them values, then C Sharp does this. So if I don't give an array values, all right, <clears throat> C Sharp does it for me. Now, the other way that I can set this up, if I know what the grades are ahead of time, and this is similar to what I showed you in class yesterday, and that is I can say int grades equal, get rid of all this, put a curly brace in. Brace in here. All right, and then I can put in those grades that you see up or down below, I should say. So in other words, I can say 100, 90, and they have to be comma separated, 81, 78, 89. I'll put it over two lines just so you can see all of it. 93, 67, 0, 98, and 88. OK, so everyone is comma separated except no comma after the last one. So doing, you know, setting up an array, an empty array like this. If I don't give them values. This is what C sharp does for me. I can go in after I set this up, I can immediately initialize it like this. Or I can come in. and do it like that. Those two ways right there that you see are equivalent to one another. Remember that arrays always start with zero. So even though there's 10 elements, they're element zero through element nine. And I just wanna make sure you've got a fundamental understanding of that as we get started. All right, try to remember to, to grab this thing and save it and send that out to you this morning as well. All right. So it says as you develop C sharp apps, you'll find many uses for arrays and collections. All right. In this chapter, we learn the basic concepts and techniques working with arrays and working with collections. So about the first 25 pages or so a little bit less are on arrays and the last 15 pages or so are on collections. All right, we problems related to each one of them. OK, so most of the time when you work with arrays, of course, not always, but most of the time when you work with arrays, you'll work with one dimensional or single dimension arrays. That's what I've shown you so far. So we'll look at that, then we'll jump into what are called rectangular arrays. All right, and they're arrays basically of more than one dimension. And if that confuses you, just hang on because we're going to go over that. All right, then next, more skills working with arrays. And finally, the chapter ends with working with collections. So we're going to look at all of this. What you're going to find if you know, I, I'll have to go back and look, but I believe again, I can be wrong on this. Please don't hold me to this. But my hope is when you take your next test, there'll be no more than three problems and probably two, but they'll get more complex. The problems I know that the test you will take next week for chapters 9, 10 and 11 has literally one problem on it. One problem. All right, 
All right, so let's jump into this. So, when you create an array, you can either do it over two lines like we've been doing, where you declare it on one line and assign it on another line, or you can do it with one statement. Here, they are putting it over two lines. Here, they are doing it in one line. Now, you'll notice the word new in there. All right, you have actually seen this before. We have earlier in the semester, we said stuff like, get rid of this. We said stuff like random brand equal new random. We've done stuff like that. And what does that do? That literally with the new, that's a keyword in the language. What this does, it creates a new object of the random class called rand. Well, in much the same way, this is going to, you know, if we look at Totals is now being declared as being a decimal object that you can kind of look at it in this case, that it has four slots where you can put information. Slot zero, slot, slot one, slot two, and slot three. You can make an array of any of the data types we've discussed so far. In other words, you can have an array of strings, you can have an array of integers, you can have an array of decimals, you can have an array of doubles, you can have an array of booleans, etc. All right. Now, quite often when you create an array, and you saw me do this yesterday, you'll create a constant that has the max or the size of the array. Then when you create the array, you'll put that constant in there. The advantage of doing that is later on, if you decide, so they've got max count here as being 50. If we wanted to change, I'm sorry, it's 100. If we wanted to change it later to 50, for example, we'd only have to change it in one place. All right. Now the default values, as are mentioned right there, that's what I showed you earlier. I made that numeric array, and I said that if you don't, when you set up an array, if you don't give uh, a numeric array values, they're automatically set to zero. Well, you can even make a character array. All right, you can have a Boolean array, and if you don't set it up, every element is false. You can have a date time array. All right, we'll look more at date times in a little bit later, and you can have reference types, which again is much later. Now, the things that you put inside of an array are known as the array elements. The length or size of the array is the number of elements in it. So late or earlier, rather, when I showed you that thing on scores or whatever we called it. All right, this right here. Grades. When you create this, there are 10 elements. Yes, they're numbered zero to nine. But the length of the array is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. All right, so to fill it, you've got to put 10 things in there. As it says, when you create an array, unless you go in yourselves and initialize it at the start, each element will be set to these default values that you see right here. All right, as far as how to assign elements to an array, I've already started to show you that as well. Again, there's no surprises here. All right, this is very similar to what I had just shown you. 
Now notice here we set the we set an array of size four, meaning that it has element zero, element one, element two, and element three. If you try to put in an element that's less than zero or greater than three in this case, you'll get an error, an exception, and it's an index out of range exception. We may not have had many or any of those thrown yet, but you can see those. So that's a decimal array. Then notice underneath that, they've got a string array. So again, name zero would hold the value Ted Lewis. Names one would hold the value Sue Jones. Names two would hold the value Ray Thomas. All right. So there's different ways that you can set these up as well. And there, I, I have never, ever in my life used the top way. I don't see the advantage of doing that and then putting in the curly braces. Since these two things are identical and this one results in about a half dozen or so less keystrokes, I always do it the second and third way. That's just the way I do things. Now, if you want, you can use the word var. Var is a special word in this language. All right. And you can kind of look at var as meaning, hey, I'm not going to give you all the information, but you can infer what I'm talking about based on what I'm giving you. So in other words, since the values that I put in here are all integers, you can basically infer that this is an array of integers. I don't, in this example they're showing you right here, I'm not sure exactly what that is buying you. All right, but we will talk about VAR later on in the semester. All right, to refer to array elements, again, element zero is the first element, element one is the second element, et cetera. The index of the last element in the array is known as the upper bound. It says if you list the values to be assigned without using the new keyword, an array will be created for you with the length based on the number. All right, and then they talk about using var. Again, if you specify an index that is negative or that's greater than your array's upper bound, you will get an index out of range exception when you try to run the program. All right, arrays are a powerful data structure. Arrays exist in this language, arrays list Arrays exist rather in JavaScript. Arrays exist basically in most every computer language. All right. And they say there now that you understand how to declare an array and assign values. You're going to see examples of this, and that is that arrays work unbelievably well with for loops. That doesn't mean that you can't use an array with a while loop or a do while loop. You can. But most of the time, most people find that when you work with these, all right, with, with arrays, you'll be using for loops or a version of the for loop that we'll get into a little bit later on in this chapter. All right. OK, I should mention to you, too, just so you see it. OK, and that is if I go out to learn.microsoft.com. All right, you can also go out to docs.microsoft.com. It'll push you right here. But if I go in there in my search, if I type in C sharp arrays and click search, there is a boatload of information out here on this. All right. Now, do you have to read it? No. But especially if you're confused, it's a great place to start. 
The other place that you might want to go to if you run into trouble here is to go out to w3schools.com, click on their tutorials, find the one for C-sharp, which is in here someplace. There it is under programming, learn C-sharp, and somewhere in here, I don't know where it is, I haven't looked lately, you're going to find arrays. All right. C sharp arrays. There you go. So there's creating an array, accessing array elements, changing array elements, array length, different ways of creating arrays, kind of like we just looked at. And they have some exercises that you can go through to again gauge your prog your progress, how to loop through arrays, how to sort arrays, which we haven't gotten to in here yet and arrays of more than one dimension. So again, just two really good places to start because the stuff we've done so far, I'm not gonna say that what we've done so far I would say that from here on out, it's going to get harder and harder, all right? meaning there's just going to be more and more terminology, more and more new concepts that are going to be shown to you, etc. All right. So here is an example of filling an array. All right, and what are we doing here? Think about this. I'm going to I want to put this up here, so let me go ahead and put a new one here. And I'm going to cut down the size because I'm at about a 72 point font. Let me cut it down to about uh, 36 should work. All right, so I'm just going to grab that example that they have right there. Int bracket bracket numbers equal new int 10. Then a for loop, for int i, I call mine LCV, i is fine, equals zero, i, less than numbers dot length i plus plus numbers i equal i and then end it now when you first look at that <clears throat> you may find that a bit confusing. Now, let's pretend this wasn't here. Just pretend that wasn't there. All right, then what that would do would be very similar to what we saw before. The system would come in, it would create numbers, zero, and it would set it equal to zero. Then it would set in numbers, one, oops, one, and it would set that equal to zero. Then it would do numbers two, three, four, et cetera. I, you, you know, type in dot, 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 but just imagine that I typed in numbers two equals zero, numbers three equals zero, all the way down to numbers nine equals zero. That's what this does right here. Just this is it creates the equivalent of 10 lines of this, all right? But what we're doing here is rather than doing that, we're giving it a for loop. Now, I right here, this confusion. First time through, here, I is zero. All right, so what we're saying here is numbers, zero equals zero. Then we run n in i now one, so numbers one is equal to one. <clears throat> so again, just kind of play computer here. So you do that right. So what this is doing, two, three, 
four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. What that for loop that you see up above is doing is what I'm showing you right here. Again, I in here is a placeholder. So the first time through since I equals zero, it's number zero. And then we're just taking whatever I is currently equal to. And we're setting that array element equal to that value. That's exactly what I'm showing you right here now. This is, in my humble opinion, kind of a contrived example. Because normally you wouldn't see it really set up much like that. All right. What I did yesterday, if you remember. In the, the numbers arrays that we set up. All right, is that I used I put random numbers in here for 25. They were supposed to symbolize 25 different grades. All right, we also went through examples where we used string arrays and we put different names of people in there. So this is just like I said, a contrived example, but yet a good example. All right. So what's kind of cool about this? Well, let's look at this example right here. All right, so they've got this array that they're creating and they're putting in four numbers. 14.95 and you need the M because it's decimal 12.95 M 11.95 M and 9.95 M. All right, so let's just look at this array that's right here. All right. Go in there and let me just move down here. And let's use their example, OK? In fact, we were working over here. So let me use the example, so I'll just move this down. Let me get some space here. All right, and let's look at the example that they have in the text here, right there. So decimal, bracket, bracket, totals, equal, and they are pre-populating the array. That means that when you are declaring it, you're giving it values. 95M, 12.95M, 11.95M, and 9.95M. These are totals. They could be prices. They could be anything. All right. The sum. And, and what they do works. So they're saying decimal sum equal totals one plus totals two plus totals three plus totals. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm wrong there. Remember, these are zero, one, two and three. Okay. So what does that mean? That means what we want to do is we want to add here. So this will be 12, I'm sorry, 14.95 plus 12.95 plus 11.95 plus 9.95. Now that works just fine. All right, so what is it? Like 15, 28, 15 and 13 would be 28, and 12 would be 40, 50. It's about 49, 80 or something like that. That's gonna be your sum. And it works just fine, but imagine that instead of doing it like this, <clears throat> what if we had 50 totals, 52, one for each week of the year? 
then you'd have to say decimal sum equals total zero plus totals one plus totals two plus totals three all the way till totals 51. That would be really tough. So another way that we could write this whole thing right here is we could come in and do this. We could say for int, let's declare a variable here called sum. Well, we've got sum, sorry. We've got this, we'll call it sum two. So decimal sum two right there. So I'll get, I'll say for int i equals zero, i less than totals dot length, i plus plus. Then if I come in and I say sum, sum two in this case, sum two plus equal totals i, we are now doing the same thing. These two examples that you see here do exactly the same thing. They both are going to add, which should be a plus sign, of course. They are both going to add these four values. The advantage of using the second one is what I just mentioned. If we have 52 totals in here, the change, if they're already in an array, I don't have to say total sub zero plus total sub one plus total sub two plus all the way up to total sub 51. All I do is the length of the array will now be 52. So it'll do the same thing. I don't think I've ever seen anybody use an array and use something like that to figure out the sum. Now, when we're done, if we wanted the average, so here we've got decimal. All right, sum, and let's make another decimal here. We'll call it AVG for average. Now, outside of the loop, I can just say AVG equals sum two divided by totals dot length. And it'll take this sum and divide it by, in this case, four, but if we had another number in there, it would divide it by that number. And since sum has already been set up as a decimal, we don't have to do any casting. And that's what they're showing you right here. All right, that's all I'm trying to show you, okay? So they go through and they do this, very similar to what I just showed you with the sum and with the average. All right. Now, this is the first time in here that we're going to look at a different type of for loop. It's a for loop, but the syntax is going to be different. And as the quote, to work with array elements. Sometimes it's easier to use a for each. Now, that's a powerful line because what I wanna say is anything that you do with array looping, you can C-A-N do with just straight for loops. All right, but quite often, what you'll want to do is instead of doing that, you might want to use a for each loop. Now let's take a look at what this looks like. All right, so the syntax is shown on top and immediately there's another example shown underneath it. All right, let's go down to this one because it's similar to what we just looked at. Okay, now. What I want to do is I want to grab that because they, they put it in there and I'm going to come and leave this one here. And then underneath it, I'm going to rewrite this using the for each loop that they're using here. All right, so we've got all this in here. Now you'll notice 
they don't have this line in curly braces. Since there's only one line here, we don't need the curly braces. I think personally, it's always not only a good idea, but the right idea to always do that anyway. So I'm going to copy this and then right below where we have it, I'm going to put it in again. So let me put a little separator in there. All right, and now what we're going to do is we're going to say, change this. I'm going to use exactly what they have there for each decimal total in totals and then sum to plus equal total. All right, and then we still have the same thing that we had before. So let's look at these so you can see the difference between them. I've got them both on the screen right now. The one on the top with the one, two, three, four, about six lines on the top is a standard for loop. Remember, in a standard for loop, you must declare a loop control variable, that's I, you must test the loop control variable, that's less than totals.length, and you must change the value of the loop control variable, I++. Notice with a for each, you declare a new variable. Total. There already is a variable called totals, but total is something we're creating right on the fly. And then we're telling this to iterate or go over every array element. So total the first time will hold totals zero. The next time will hold totals one, et cetera. Now, when you use it for each, whatever you use it on, whatever you use it on, you must, it, it's got, it, it has to go and do the operation on every array element. I want to say that again. When you use a for each, as is shown in the example right here, you must use, you know, it must iterate or go over every array element. What if in here, as an example, what if this was an array of tests in here? All right. And what if I wanted to say, I wanted to put an if statement in there that said, if only only go through and add these if the person if we had passing grades. In other words, we we didn't want to include failing grades. If the grade happened to be um less than 60 just skip it you can't do that with a for each with a for each you must work your way and utilize every array element all right some people just love these four h's some people get confused by them all right i'm kind of ambivalent i can go either way all right if you're confused with using a for each like this, just use this. Whether it is in the classroom, all right, or if you're out in the real world and you're working at a company, they want results and they want the correct results. It's going to be very rare if ever that somebody is going to come up and look at your code and go, why did you use a standard for loop there rather than a for each loop? You know, I, I couldn't imagine somebody saying that personally. All right. So as it says, you can use a for each loop to access each array element. You can also use it for collections like we'll talk about later on in the chapter. All right, it's it's kind of funny when you talk about a rectangular array, which is also known as a two dimensional array, because I've gone through this before with people and they've told me, 
hey, I kind of understood arrays, but now we're into two dimensional arrays and I'm just totally confused. So I'll ask them. Have you ever worked with Microsoft Excel? I literally have had this call, this talk with people before. Yeah, yeah, I, I've worked with it. So for example, this element is what? It's element C1. What does that mean? Or C5, I should say. It's column C and row five. Yeah, guess what? That is a two-dimensional array. But when you work with it in Excel, you list the column first and then the row number. When you work in a programming language, you say the row first and then the column. Let's just use this. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to stretch this across like this. So there are now 20 elements in here. I mean, if it's easier for you, we can go right at the top here. All right. So imagine those 20 elements. In fact, let's make them a different color with what we'll put in here. So this would be zero, zero. Oops. Try that again. So that would be zero, zero. That would be zero, one. That would be zero, two. That would be zero, and that would be four. Make that one red as well. Now, if I take these, And I, uh, I thought I was copying them. I guess I wasn't. All right. Now I'm going to change these, and this is now going to become one zero. This will become one 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 two one three and one four. And I know you get it. You're all intelligent people. All right, but this will now become two zero, two one, two two, two three, and two four. And finally, this will become. Three zero, three one, three two, three three, and three four. Now, a couple things about this, most of which I'm sure you already can tell. There are 20 elements in this array. How do I know that? A real fast way to find out is I can multiply the number of rows, which is four, by the number of columns, which is five. So four times five is going to give me 20. Also, the way you refer to the first column, if this was in Excel, this would be A1, meaning it's column A, row one. The way we refer to it here is zero comma zero, which means it's row zero, column zero. when my internet connection keeps failing this morning, and it's now row three, column zero, all right? So what does that have to do with anything? Well, what you'll notice when we jump back into our book and you work with these rectangular arrays, also known as a two-dimensional array, first, let me say, you can have arrays of as many dimensions. You literally could have a 15-dimensional array. It's typically very rare that you'll see arrays that have more than three, maybe dimensions. 
it's hard for us to put something in that we can't conceive or we can't conceptualize in our minds. All right, so typically you won't have arrays more than two or three dimensions. But you'll notice that when we assign values, does that look familiar? All right, so if we wanted to put values in here, and let's imagine that what we wanted to put in those values, I'm just gonna make these up. So 10, 20, 30, 40. All right, and then this one will be 100, 200, 300, 400. Then going down, it'll be 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, and finally 10,000, 20,000, 30,000, and 40. Thousand like that. All right. Then I'll just show you the first row here. This would be so imagine this is what I want here. All right. And let's just say it was totals. I'd say totals. All right. Zero. Zero. Equal 10. All right, and as you can imagine then, this next one here would be totals one, zero, would be 20. This would be totals two, zero, and it would be 30. And finally, we'd have totals 3, 0, and it would be 40. OK, and we could keep going. Hopefully you just get the idea. So these lines right here are symbolizing the values that are in here. That are in, come on, that are in here. All right. So what you look in here, what do you see? OK. Again, when we look at the example smack dab in the middle here. Row zero, column zero is set to one. Row zero, column one is set to two. Row one, column, et cetera. You can see that. Now, if you want to manually assign values, when you declare the array, notice how this differs. You now have curly braces within curly braces. All right. Just another way you can do this. Now, for a more real. The first element that's in there, the zeroth element, I should say, is what, you know, this product, maybe it's a product code. So C Sharp or Java or ASP MVC. The second thing that's in there is maybe a title of a book. Murox C Sharp, Murox Java Programming, Murox ASP.NET MVC many of the things that we're going to end up I'm going to have to contact Charter at the end of the day today because this is getting ridiculous. All right. But many of the things that you're going to end up using are going to be things that are known as key value pairs. So the key would be C sharp. The value would be Miroc C sharp. The key would be Java. 
The value would be Murox Java programming. The key would be ASP MVC. The value would be Murox ASP.NET MVC, et cetera. Then they show another way of doing it with using that VAR again. So as mentioned here on the bottom of the page, a rectangular array then uses two indexes to store data. As it says, you can think of it as a table with rows and columns, and it is row column driven, not column row. Everybody does it in a row column format. All right. Rectangular arrays are sometimes called two dimensional arrays. Some books even call them an array of arrays. All right, it says although it's rarely necessary, you can have more than two dimensions. It depends on what you're working with. All right, I mean, as a three an example of a three dimension, think about this. What if a salesperson, all right, had different regions? maybe a northern region in the country, a southern region, an eastern region, and a western region. And each one of those had their own values or whatever. There are occasions where you could use these. All right, now, when you are going and initializing these, you'll notice the big thing is you'll have a loop within a loop. All right, the outer loop is going through the rows, the inner loop is going through the columns. I want to say that again. You can see in the example there that you have a for loop within a for loop. The outer for loop, the one right here, is going through your rows. The inner for loop that you have right here is going through your columns. Now they talk about this get length. Sure, you can use that to get the number of rows or columns in a rectangular array. There's other ways that you can do it as well. Okay, all right. So the next thing that's in here is the array class, and I've already introduced that to you here. All right, so let's try to change this search to the C-sharp array class. All right, array class, there you go. So you go out there and find definitions, you can find examples, that's all fine and dandy. But what I wanna show you, if, if I can keep going down here, are properties. So these are properties arrays have. They have a length, that's the only one of these we've talked about. And there's not many, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, looks like about eight. And there's methods. I'm not going to count these. So I'd probably screw it up. But if you told me there were upwards of 100 different methods in there, I believe you. So these are all of the different things between these here and these eight things up here. When you type in array with a capital A dot, the IntelliSense is going to show you these eight things and then all these things that you can use. Now, we haven't used very many of these things that are in here. We did a binary search yesterday. We did an array dot sort. And we did an array dot reverse. You'll notice as an example here with the reverse, there is one, two, three, four different things that say reverse. What that means is the reverse method is overloaded, which means depending on what you pass it in the parentheses, if you're using parens or with these brackets that you see here, the If I go down to the sort here, you'll notice there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 
17. So there's 17 different ways that you can use sort. Most of the time, you're just going to use them this way. That's how I used it yesterday. All right, but you've got a lot of different possibilities in here, depending on what you're trying to. About the array class in here. They start talking about the array class in here. All right. And here are some of the things that you can use. By no means is this an exhaustive list. I already mentioned to you just a few minutes ago. All right. I already mentioned to you a few minutes ago that, for example, you know, when we just looked at all the different methods for the array class, I said there were probably upwards of 100 of them. And here we're showing about a half dozen. But these are ones that you would probably use often. So the length is just that. It gets the length of the number of elements in the array. Get length returns the number of elements for the dimension. All right. And typically it's used you know, with row or column or whatever. Get upper bound it gives you the index of the last element. Copy is kind of a neat one. Copy is relatively new in here. Back when I was your age and I was starting to do this stuff, if you wanted to copy one array to another array, you had to basically create your first array, then create a loop and copy things over one element at a time. You don't have to do that anymore. Now, when you go through and do a copy like this, you can just copy it copy one entire array to another entire array in one line of code. Or you can just copy part of an array to another array. The binary search we've looked at yesterday, we'll talk about it again in a bit. Sorting, again, by default, sorting returns things in ascending order. As it says in the note on the bottom of the page, and I showed you this example yesterday, the binary search method works only on arrays whose elements are in ascending order. If an array isn't in ascending order, if you want to do a binary search, you must first run the sort method on it to put it in ascending order. All right. So how to refer to and be able to copy arrays. All right. Now, this is a little bit confusing. All right. You're saying here, create a new array called inches one that has these three values in it. Then here you're saying inches two equals, or inches one, inches two equals inches one. Now. That's a bad example. That's not making a copy. That's making a reference or almost like an alias. Now, if you change in change the array, you can change it using either inches one or inches two. They will both change the same array. A little confusing. The array dot copy. There are examples right here. An array is a reference type. Who cares? You should care a lot. If you pass an array into a method, if you pass an entire array into a method, what you are passing in is not a copy of the array. You are passing the address of the first element of the array, so where the array lives. So when you pass an entire array into a function or method, 
since you're passing it in as a reference type, any changes you make are permanent changes. I want to say that again. If you pass an array from one function or method into another function or method, the entire array, you pass it in as a ref or reference type, meaning that any changes you make to it are permanent changes. On the other hand, if you copy, I'm sorry, if you pass in an individual one function or method to another function or method, all right, it's passed by copy. So if you want to be able to change it, you pass it by reference, you pass the whole thing in. It's pretty much what they're saying here. How to code methods that work with arrays. I did some of this with you yesterday. I showed you how to, to go in and find the biggest element in an array. In fact, I showed you a couple of ways of doing that. I showed you how to find the smallest element in an array. I showed you how to find the median or middle element in an array. I showed you how to find a range in an array. All right, so we looked at all those. I showed you how to sum the elements in an array. All right, I showed you how to uh, get the average element in an array, et cetera. So we went through a lot of this stuff yesterday. So the author says here, to return an array from a method or to pass it in, you must include the parens. All right, not only the type like we've been doing, but the, I'm not the parens, I'm sorry, the brackets right here. Now, there's also something special in here that's called params, the params keyword right there. Let's take a look at what it says on the bottom of the page here. It says first to return an array from a method all right, you code the set of brackets after the return type. I already mentioned that. To accept an array as a parameter, you code them, and we just talked about that. Again, by default, an entire array passed in is passed by reference. Again, meaning that any changes you make are permanent. There's two or more arguments. All right, you can include the params keyword. And if you do that, that'll grab things that were not set up as an array, but it'll basically store them into an array. All right. Now, this can become very important using params. And we'll get into that in a little bit more depth and breadth of coverage at a later time. All right. Now, this is going to probably be a bit confusing here, but they're going to talk about the null conditional operator. So rather than doing what I usually do, and that is just jumping right to this page here, I'm going to go over the stuff that they talk about here. This null conditional operator will be used here, but you see the use of the null conditional operator in a lot of different places, including at times at least when you work with databases. All right, so as they mentioned here, when you work with objects like arrays, all right, you may need to test for null values. Why is that even important? If an array contains null, meaning that the values are unknown and you can have that happen. If you try to reference those values when they've got a All right. So to get around that, you know, if you tell, want to tell the system, hey, I, I don't, I don't, 
you know, if there's null in there, I don't want you to blow up. You can use the null conditional operator that they're going to show on the next page. So as it says, the statement in the first example creates an array named initials and assigns a value of null to it. Then the statement in the second example attempts to access the first element in the array and convert it to uppercase. What the heck does that even mean? All right, it means if you do this, if you if you create an array of strings that are called, it's called initials, and if you initialize it to null, which is totally legit to do, and you attempt to access one of the elements that's in there before you've actually set it up, you're going to get this null reference exception. So how can you get around that? All right, well, one way is to use if statements. So you can say is, hey, if it's not null, basically to do what you want to do. The other way around it is to use this null, you know, is to use the null conditional operator, which is a question mark. And you'll notice in here, we use it in this case in one, two, Now, I don't know, I, I'm going to have to check, but I, I'm hoping at least that when I'm when I'm getting these little blips um, with my internet going down and coming up again, it's not affecting the, uh, the video. If it does, please let me know, all right? And I'll, if I have to, I'll retape it. So, it says here, if you try to access a member or an element of an object that contains null, you can get a null reference exception. One way to prevent that is to use if statements. So it says an easier way is to use the null conditional operator, the question mark, which checks the object or element to see if it's null. And if it finds null, it just kind of stops. It doesn't do anything else. All right. Because the null conditional operator can cause a null value to be returned, it says the value or the variable that the return value is assigned to must be defined as a nullable type as well. That's why they've got the question mark here. You can use the null conditional operator with any object in any element. Now, where that becomes really important I have never had this bad a problem before with my internet connection as I'm having today, and I apologize. All right, next, more ways to refer to array elements. Now, this is sort of like some of the stuff that you can do in JavaScript. Now, we didn't talk about most of this stuff in JavaScript because it was at the end of our book. So it was just mentioned in passing, but there are operators that you can use in C sharp here that are similar to the operators that you can use in JavaScript. One of those is the range operator, which are two dots. Kind of neat because what it can do is, for example here, notice here we've got an array called sales and it's got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight elements in it. Element zero, element one, element two, element three, element four, element five, element six, and element seven. All right, what if I only want to work with part of that? Then I can do, 
for example, 0 0.3, which will just work with element 0, element 1, and element 2. It doesn't include the last number that's in there. All right, I can say 6 dot dot. Well, since there's only, you know, the last element is 7, it would just be these two here. Again, this is one of those things that if you if you say, I don't get it, it's kind of confusing, don't use it. But it's another one of these things that are available to you in the language. You'll notice again, they're fairly new. So with C sharp, by coding the range operator, which is two dots, okay? There's an, a few other things that you can do in here. I'm not even gonna go over these. Using this index and using the caret, I think it's too confusing. I never use anything like that. If you wanna read it and there's something that you're interested in using, go for it. Great, seriously. All right, the last thing that's discussed in the array part this chapter is working with list patterns. All right. So it says in chapter five, you learn to use pattern matching with if statements, switch statements, etc. Now you can also use it with an array. And here's what it looks like. Now it's a little confusing. So notice here we are creating an integer array called quantity. It has one, two, three, four elements in it. Quantity zero, or typically referred to as quantity sub, or subscript zero is 100. Quantity sub two is 200. Quantity sub three is 300. Quantity sub four is 400. Well, then notice, as it says, you can do list patterns. Okay, now you'll notice when we look in here, the only one of these here that is true out of the first three. We'll talk about that one in a minute, but this one is true because it lists all the values. This one is false because they don't have 300 in it. This one is false because we don't have 400 in it. This one is true because we use that discard value for the last one. All right. So here, this is another one, they're, they're matching patterns. So if it's less than 200, okay, that'll match that one. If it's 200 or 300, so that'll match these two. If it's greater than 300, greater than or equal to 300 and less than 400, well, that doesn't match any, well, I guess that matches 300. If it's greater than 200, so that'll match all three of these. All right, I've never had reason to use a list pattern in here, but it can make for some interesting coding. So as it says, a list pattern lets you match a sequence of patterns against the elements in an array. You can also use a list pattern to match the elements in a collection. We're going to get into collections in just a couple minutes. You can use a list pattern with the is operator with a not operator, and you can use them in case statements. You can use a slice pattern within a list pattern to match zero or more elements at the beginning. So in other words, you can take a hunk out, so to speak. And then there's that discard pattern that we talked about just a minute ago. All right. The rest of the chapter, the last 15 or so pages, are going to talk about collections. Let's take a look at what it says here. Like an array, a collection can hold one or more elements. Unlike an array, collections don't have a fixed size. They're a little bit different. As an example, and I'm going to jump back. I'm going to actually jump ahead a little bit here. All right, 
if I come in like this and create a collection, this is an array list collection, not an array, but an array list. I think by default, since we didn't put a number in there, I believe that it, it defaults to a size of 16. All right, but something kind of neat happens. If I keep combining, you know, adding things and adding things and adding things and I get to where I've added a 16 thing. If I try to add something else rather than breaking, it doubles the size of the collection. So it now becomes 32. When I fill that up, it then becomes 64, etc. So as it says, unlike collections, unlike arrays rather, collections don't have a fixed size. Instead, the size is automatically increased when ele increases when elements are added to it. They're mutable, which means they can, you can add to them, you can remove from them while the program is, is running. If you remember one of the things I showed you earlier today was we looked at this and I said, collections in C sharp, like lists, for example, or array lists are late binded. They're set at runtime. So you can change the size as the program is running. It says here in the topics that follow, you learn how to use five types of collections. Lists, sorted lists, queues, stacks, and array lists. It says although .NET provides for even other collections than these, these are the ones you'll use the most often. All right. We're going to concentrate. Lists and array lists. All the sorted list is it's 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 in a list that's been sorted. A queue we've talked about a little bit. Maybe we have, maybe we haven't, but let's talk about it then. All right. If you decide this week you're going to go, it's Friday night, you're going to go to see a new movie that comes up. All right. And you don't buy your tickets online. You walk into the theater and there's four people in front of you. That's a queue. The first person in line will be the first person served. And if there's four people in front of you, four people will be served and then you'll be served. All right. So it's what's called a FIFO. FIFO or a first in, first out, all right, type of structure. A stack is kind of the reverse of that. With a stack, what most people equate with a stack is if you remember back in your high school days, if in your cafeteria, If you push them down into that machine, all right, the one you grab is the top one. So the last one in is the first one out. Those are cues and stacks, but we're going to concentrate mainly on lists in here, to be honest with you. So, it says .NET provides two types of collection classes. First, it includes collection classes that can store anything. All right, they're typically referred to as untyped collections. Now, you can even store different types in there, but it's not a good idea. And I'll give you an example on the next page that although. The second type prevents these. They're called typed collections. You specify the data type within these angle brackets here. And typically when you use that, you, you well, we're gonna look at some examples in just a minute. So it says here that the, um, 
we're going to see four of the most commonly used typed and untyped collections. When you want to use these, <clears throat> if you want to use typed collections, you'll have to add or put a using statement in there for using system.collections.generic. If you use untyped collect co collections, you'll typically have a using system.collections. Okay. Now, typed collections, as they mentioned there, have several advantages. And that's typically the kind you're going to want to use. Why is that? Well, let's look here. All right. So, it says arrays and collections are similar. They can both store multiple elements. They're both reference types when you pass them. How are they different? An array is part of the C sharp language. A collection is part of .NET. Collections provide methods that arrays don't. We'll look at some of those in just a bit. But the big one is that third bullet you see there. Arrays are fixed in size. Collections are variable in size. That is the difference between the two. So you'll notice that with all of these, list, sorted list, queue, and stack, all of them have in there these angle brackets, a less than sign followed by something with a greater than sign. All right. Now you'll also notice that other than the sorted list, they what, what's in these angle brackets in the list, in the queue, and in the stack are the letter T. And all T means is that's going to be the type of, of thing you're working with. A sorted list has two things in there. The K is for the key. The V is for the value. All right. So it uses a key to access a value. You won't have to really worry too much about those in this class. Now, you know, one thing you've got to realize when you look in here and when we go through this book, and this is a really good book. I have no problems with the book. If there was a way, we're on page 255 right now, so we're somewhere around a third of the way through the book, approximately, okay? But there are going to be things that are discussed in this book that are over the heads of people learning something in an introductory level. What I mean is, and that's not a slam, really. Please, I apologize if you think it is, because it's not. But what I'm telling you is, all right, what I'm trying to tell you here is, there are things in here that are going to be introduced that we're not going to use. We're not going to do, well, we're going to do some work with lists, but we're not going to do really anything with sorted lists, queues, or stacks. All right? So a collection is an object that can hold one or more elements. The collection classes are going to be system.collections.generic if it's typed and systems.collections without the dot generic if it's untyped. So again, let's talk about the difference. If you're using untyped, all right, notice what we've got here. We're creating a brand new array list. It's still an array, so all of our values have to be of the same type. So we're adding a number, we're adding another number. Oh boy, we're adding a string. It won't give us an error when we add it. However, when we attempt to compile and run the program, it'll give. Bring something non numeric in there. On the other hand, so that's using system.collections. On the other hand, if you use using system.collections.generic and you give it a type like this, and look at the syntax because it looks different from what we've seen before. The other stuff just said array list numbers equal new array list. That looks a lot like an array without the brackets. All right, so it looks similar to what we've done before. This looks pretty different. This says that what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a new 
list, everything that's in there will be an integer and it will be called numbers. So numbers will be a list of integers. Now, if you try doing that same thing that we saw up above, where you put in a number, you put in a number, and then you put in a string, boom, it won't even compile. All right. So as they mentioned here on the bottom of the page, typed collections have two advantages over untyped. First, they check the type of each element at compile time, and that prevents runtime errors. Second, you don't have to really do any casting. Now it says here, by default, Visual Studio adds a using directive for the system.collections.generic namespace for anything that you create, all right, if you're using a certain version. But if, it's, if you don't have it in there, you just manually add it, okay? All right, so since the one we're going to work with the most in here is a list, let's go through this part of the chapter in maybe a little bit more depth and breadth of coverage than we will the sorted list and the queue and the stack. All right. It says you're now ready to learn how to use the list T class to create and work with the list, the most common of typed collections. So as mentioned here, to create a list, you use the new keyword to create an object from list T as shown in part one. When you do this, you must specify the data type within angle brackets immediately after the class name. You've already seen this, but let's look again. So here is an example. And again, it looks a little different because it's a different type of data structure. So what we're saying here is, we're going to create a new list. Everything that's in there will be a string. Since we're not putting a number in here, all right, it'll start, I think it defaults to 16. It'll be called titles. Again, title is a list of strings. Here we're doing a similar thing, but we're creating a new list. The type is decimal. Decimals, all right. We're doing the same thing as before, but we're giving it a size to begin with. We're giving it a size of three. So after we put in elements zero, one, and two, the list will automatically double so that it's of size six. Once we put in three, four, and five, it'll double again and become 12. All right, and hopefully that just makes sense as we keep going. Now, what really makes these things something are these methods that we're going to look at right now. You'll notice that with the with the indexer, it says the index for the first item in the list is zero, just like it was in an array. There's a capacity property. Gets or sets the number of elements the list can hold. There's a count, which has how many elements are currently in the list. But again, these methods that you see in here are in many ways much more powerful than what we used with arrays. You can add, and that's talking about adding brand new elements to the end of a list. You can clear to remove all the elements from a list and set that count property to zero. There's a contains. Notice it returns a Boolean, which means it returns true if a list contains whatever element you're looking for and it returns false if it doesn't. All right, add insert something at the end of a list. Insert will allow you to insert something into a list at a specific place. Remove will remove the first occurrence or the first thing in the list. Remove at, you give it an index to remove a certain element. Notice there's another binary search in here. And there's a sort in here. The only way that this is going to make any sense whatsoever is for us to go through some examples. So we will after we get through with the chapter. All right. 
So they do show you some examples in here and notice it's three. So once you put in zero, one and two, as it says, it doubles to six. Once you put in four, three, four and five, it doubles again to 12. So as mentioned here on the bottom of the page, <clears throat> a list is a collection that automatically adjusts its capacity to accommodate new elements. The default, as it says, is zero, but you don't have to. And it's not, well, I always thought it was 16. Maybe they changed that. All right, but it's always going to be doubling whenever it has to. The list T again is part of the system dot collections dot generic namespace. So they go through and give you some examples. And they show you how it can be used here. All right. Again, the main advantages of using a list, because this is the same kind of thing we did before with an array. So why would you want to use an, a, a list? Because you can add new elements to a list. elements in a list, you can remove current elements in a list. With an array, you cannot add new elements. You can you can modify existing elements, but you can't add new elements. You cannot remove existing elements. You can just modify. So in that way, a list is much stronger and much more what I would call extensible. E X T E N S I B L E, I believe, which means it's more like silly putty. You can stretch it, and make it do things that you can't stretch and make happen with an array. Notice as, it's, notice as it says in here that a sorted list is useful when you need to look up values. So kind of like a lookup table. So maybe you've got uh, a list of 10,000 employees and you've got an employee number. That would be the key. And when you put in the key, it shows you the employee name. That would be the value. Or maybe you've got the employee name and that would be a key and, and the value would be the department they work for, whatever. There's a, different ways these can be used. As it says, if for example, a sorted list contains or consists of item numbers and unit prices, all right, the keys would be the item numbers. They'd have to be unique. All right, so you can put in a unique item number and find the price for that item. Kind of like when you think the way that um, UPC and you know universal price codes, the codes, et cetera, are used. All right, if you've ever scanned your own groceries at a store, for example, or ever gone to a Walmart or some other place where you can scan not just groceries, but other types of items. So as it says, the keys are typically referred to as key value pairs <clears throat> or a KV type of structure. Like a list, it says there, you can set the initial capacity of a sorted list if you want to or need to. Now, there's a few things that you can use in here, and they'll mention this instead of an add, the second example, you will use what's called a collection initializer, as it says, because each element consists of two values. Each element is enclosed in curly braces. There is also something called an index initializer where you don't code the key and value within braces. Now, personally, I think that this is a good way to confuse the heck out of people. That's why the only one that we're going to really concentrate on here is a quote, regular list, unquote. You won't have to worry, other than if they ask for them on your written test, 
you won't have to worry about sorted list or queues or stacks. All right. But again, since this uses virtually a key value or key value pairs, you can work with the keys, you can work with the values. The capacity and the count are like what we saw before. The add and the clear are what, like what we saw before. The remove and the remove at are like what we saw before. But notice there's a contains key and a contains value, which we didn't have previously. So here's an example of that. And then we've got these initializers. So what they're saying here <clears throat> is you can initialize a sorted list just like you can initialize initialize rather an array. Finally, on the bottom, as it says there, the items in a sorted list consist of key value pairs, and they're always sorted by key value. They're always sorted by key, not by value, but by key. All right. And they show you some more examples in here again. I think this is enough on that because I'm not trying to confuse anybody. All right. So it says you can use the key for any item to look up the value for that item. The items are sorted in a sorted list are created in the key value pair structure. And you can work with one or both of those on an as needed basis. The last thing that's mentioned in here on the last four or five pages of the chapter are queues and stacks. They do mention queues like I said to you that they're a FIFO kind of structure. First in, first out. All right. When you want to add something to a queue, so in other words, if another person comes in line at the movie theater, you use the NQ method. So if there were four people in front of me and I'm the fifth, I can now use NQ and I'm added to the end of the queue. If the first person in line has been taken care of, you can use the DQ method. So we can remove them basically from the queue. Push push will place an item on the top of the stack pop will grab the top item off of the stack all right now most languages do provide for queues and stacks some of them do them a little bit differently so as you can see with the queue we put in bane then taylor then muroc so they go in that order all right. That's when we're using a queue with a stack. We put them in Bane, Taylor, Mirox. So Mirox now on top. OK, so as it says, queues and stacks provide distinct features that let you process them like lists. A queue is also known as a FIFO collection because first in, first out, a stack is sometimes referred to as a LIFO collection because it's Hmm. Again, my internet connection just keeps going and going and going, not in a good way. All right, the last thing that's discussed in the chapter here, the last couple pages, is an array list. All right, it says, although you'll probably type lists whenever possible, the last figure that's in here will show you how to work with an array list. As it says, the most common 
untyped collection. It says this should illustrate both the similarities and differences between typed and untyped lists. For the most part, an array list works like a list. However, since it defines an untyped collection, there are a few differences. First, when you create an object from an array list class, you don't give it a type with a T in the cur in the angle brackets. Instead, each element is stored as an object type. The process of putting those in is known as boxing, and typically taking them out is known as unboxing. All right, and they do give you a couple of examples regarding this on page 269. All right, I'm not going to say another word about those other than as it says on the bottom of the page, the array list class is part of the system dot collections namespace. It has the same properties as the list, so it's fairly easy to convert an array list to a list and vice versa. Now, that's it. In this chapter, you learn how to use both arrays and collections. The chapter was much more array intensive, in my opinion, than it was collection intensive. So we're going to concentrate more on arrays than we are on collections. And again, the only collection that we're going to really talk about and work with in much detail will be the list collection. All right, it says as you develop your own apps, you need to decide between the use of an array or a collection. You may or may not have noticed something in this chapter, and that is the fact that there were really no examples in the chapter that went through complete programs. All right, what I'm going to attempt to do right now, and I have not done this ahead of time as I usually do, and that is I am going to close a bunch of this stuff that's open and see if I can find my, this is my payroll app that we wrote a long time ago, and we have three payroll consoles and four payroll GUI apps right now. All right, and I, yeah, I believe, yes, this is the last one that we did. So let me close a couple of these. So I think this is number four right here, and hopefully you remember this. I'll make sure I set it as a startup project. And let's run it. Okay, hopefully you remember this. We looked at it before. So we've got first names, last names, all right, hours worked, hourly rate, etc. You can see all that good stuff. All right, well, wouldn't it be kind of neat if we could bring this up? I'll bring up an employee, and let's say that we come in here. And we have trying to think of a way to do this where I can teach you something and hopefully also make it work. All right, so let's see. We've got a first name and a last name. Yeah, you can see that. I'm going to try something here. So we're going to try something right here. This is either going to be a flaming success or a flaming failure, but I'm going to come in here and I'm going to start off by. Let's see, come into our design mode here. And I'm immediately going to un. I've got my controls locked and why is it not going to let me unlock them? Well, let's see if we can unlock them. You'll see what I'm doing hopefully in just a minute. So I'm going to click these two and I'm going to try to unlock them. And I'm going to move them over to here. Like, like about like that. Let's make this a little bit smaller here so it lines up with the other ones. 
There, that looks good. And I'm going to move this down. And I'm going to move this down. OK, why did I do that? I mean, you might be like, yeah, I see what you did, but. Four. I introduce a new field in here. We're going to see if this works. OK, if it works great. If it doesn't work, at least we're all, we're, we're all going to learn something here. So I'm going to copy these. And I'm going to paste. And we're like I said, we're just trying something here. This may work. This may not work. I'm warning you in advance. This may not work. So I'm going to come up here and I'm going to do this. I am going to start by clicking on here. In fact, I want to move this all down just a little bit. Probably should widen this out, but I think it'll be OK the way it is. All right. So where I've got this, this first name that's right here, and then this. Wondering why right now. When I click on this, I'm not getting anything in my properties window. And I don't know why I'm not. Oh, well, let's come over to here. Well, let's just do this. Let me do a file save all. And. Oh, that's what I wanted to do. OK, I wish I wouldn't have saved that, but. um, Let's do this. I'm going to start a new project. That'll make this much, much cleaner. So let me go back and do this. So I go to my solution here, right mouse click. And I'm going to do an add new project. You've seen this many, many times before. Windows form. All right, and there is my .NET app C Sharp Windows form. I'm going to call this payroll GUI 05. Hit enter, and there that is. OK. I'm going to stretch this out. I'm going to go back to my previous one. Control A, Control C to copy, and I'm going to paste that into here. There, now I've got. OK, there's a start. Now I want to go back to the one I was just at here, and I want to remove this that I put in here. I'm just going to get rid of it. Then I'm going to move this one back up. Back. There, that's the way it had looked previously. Now this should still work and there should be no problem with it. Let's double check. So I'm going to do a file, save all. All right, and I'm going to make sure that this four is set up. As my start project, and if I do come in here. And I run it, so Jeff, Scott, 50, 10. OK, I've got everything working. I've got my overtime, my total number of gross pays, my gross pay amount, my et cetera. We get all that stuff. So. All right, so that's all, that's good, that's all working. So let me do a file, save all here, okay? And let me get rid of this and get rid of this. Now I'm gonna write this one a little bit differently. And if you say, I don't know what you mean, okay? Take a second, all right, and let me, let me get this. Let me do what I always do. And I know that some people, it kind of drives them nuts the way that I code and stuff, but whatever. So I'm going to come in here and the first thing I'm going to do is what did I call this FRM pay? OK, so this will be. FRM payroll, OK. So this one right here. 
I'm going to rename. And it will be FR, FRM payroll GUI 05. Yes, I want to change everything. All right, now let's come in here and let's change the background color. Not going to use green because that was the last one. I don't know what I've used previously, but I'm going to just try yellow. That works. And then I'm going to highlight all of these. And I'm going to highlight all of these. Change the, that background color as well to a darker yellow. And the white doesn't show very well there. It looks actually this whole thing looks. Well, well, we'll fix that coloring in just a minute, but let's change the foreground color here back to black. And finally, let's click on here again. Whoops, come on, click off, come on. And see if I can set the background color for the entire form to that lighter yellow. There we go, that's what I wanted. All right, now, I'm going to try to do something I have not tried to do before. So again, flame and failure or flame. All right. Where I've got first name here, I'm going to change that. Right now it has no name. Go back to here. It's just called label one. And I'm going to LBL OE ID. And the text for this is going to be employee ID. All right, so we've got that. This is going to be called TXT employee ID. All right, so we've got all that. I'm going to leave these buttons, but I'm going to add another one. I want to make this a little bit bigger. So let me unlock. Right one lock here. All right. I just want a little more space than I currently have in here. All right. I'm going to add something new though. Okay, I'm going to move over my exit button. I'm going to copy it and put in another button here. Doesn't look too bad. I guess it could be spaced a little bit further. Like that doesn't look too bad. But this one that now is called button one, I'm going to call this BTN lookup. All right, and I'm going to put the text on there as lookup. What I want to be able to do is I want to be able to come in here. Why that lock doesn't seem to be working very well. Okay. All right. What I want to be able to do is run this program, come in here, and I want to be able to put in. I want to be able to put in an employee number here. And then click look up and I want the system to give me the employee's first name, the hours worked and the hourly rate. All right, I want it to be first name and last name. OK, so to do this. This is like I said, either going to be really cool or really, really bad. All right. So let's see if we can do this first using an array. And if we can get that to work, we may even come back and try to redo this one using a list. All right. All right. So right now I've got my calculate. I don't think I have any code into these right now. Calculate, clear, look up and exit. So let's double check. Calculate again, nothing in it. Clear, nothing in it. Look up, nothing in it. And exit, nothing in it. Well, let's steal the code for the first three buttons. 
So from calculate, let's steal the code from our fourth version here. Okay. This is all stuff we did previously. So under calculate here, I'm going to grab all this. Then I'm going to grab that is valid data. And I'm going to grab the is present and the is decimal and the is in 32 and the is within range. So I grabbed all those. In fact, while we're doing that, let's also grab this clear. We'll grab everything almost. Grab the calculate gross pay. We'll grab the update accumulators. All right, so we'll grab all that. Copy that to the clipboard, just so you don't have to watch me type, that's all. So in the calculate button right here, I'm gonna paste all of that in. Might get an error if I screwed something up. Looks like I've got a bunch of errors in here because I didn't add all of my uh, global variables and the like. So let's find those. Was up at the top. So let me grab all that. Let me put that right up above here. So I want to get back to this one. View my code. Let's jump way up to the top. Let's get rid of this because we don't need it. And right underneath our initialized component, let's put that in. That should I was going to say remove a lot of our errors. I'll pretty it up in just a bit. But let's go back to four here. And let's go to our clear all. There's that. And finally, under our uh, exit, we'll move the, we'll put the look up underneath the exit. Okay, but I want to grab that exit stuff that we had from before. That's our old friend exit program or not. And I might as well grab the show message and bring that in there too. Okay, so let's see. All right, all of my errors are gone. So the new thing we're going to put in here is going to be the lookup. Okay. All right. Now, in order to do this, all right, this, what I'm doing in here probably would have worked better if we were as a console, but I want you to be able to see what we're doing. First of all, let's see if right now it even works. I don't have anything in the lookup yet, and that's okay. Uh, that's the old one. So let's let's close this old one that was open here. All right, let's do a file save all on this, and let's set our startup project to the new one that we just did, this yellow one. And let's see if it works. All right, I still have to go back and probably set my tab order and everything else in here, so that's okay. But actually, that tab order looks like it's working. But okay, that's all working. That works. That works. Okay, we got a lot of stuff already done, in other words. So let's come back and let's set immediately. Let's come in here and let's set up our accept button to be our calculate. Let's set our cancel button to be our clear. All right, let's set our start position 
to be center screen. And uh, let's see, let's change that text up there for our form. And we're going to put in here uh, C sharp payroll program using arrays. OK. Oh, I put it in the wrong place. So let me get rid of that. All right, so on the form, in the text, I want this to be C sharp payroll program using arrays. Now it changed. OK, I've got that. And I've got a calculate button here. That's all I've got. So let's let's add these. So we, we put these in here as more menu options. Uh, I want to move those around later, but I'll put in here clear. And look, whoops, and look up. Now I know exactly what I want to do in this program. You don't, and I get that. All right. For now, I'm not going to be worried about the calculate stuff, but what I want to do is if I put in, for example, right there, if I put in um, one zero zero one and that's me, so if I put in one zero zero one and I click look up, I want it to give me first name, last name, hours worked, and hourly rate for me. And if I click calculate, I want to be able to get all that information. So I'm going to set this up. So that what I'm going to have in here is I'm going to have a series of arrays. I'm going to have an array. This would work better if I was using something like a structure or something else. But um, let's see. We're just going to try it. OK, like I said, we'll see if it works and if it doesn't. The heck. So I'm going to go back, come back up to here. A few code. And there's my lookup. OK, I want to come up to the top of my program here and add some stuff. So I want it to be global. Now all this stuff that's in here, the hours worked, all those goodies, they're all fine. I have to start being so stop being so squirrely about this. Those I'm not even going to even out. That's fine the way it is. All right. But let's go in and let's add some global arrays. All right. So the first one is going to be a string, and we'll call it in here employee IDs. And it's going to be in a. All right, and it'll be equal to rather than saying new string and giving it a size, et cetera. I'm going to just manually put these in there. So we will, we're going to put in 10 numbers. 1001. 2002. I'm making these up if you haven't figured that out already. Let me put these on multiple lines because I think it'll look better by doing that. Oops, not that. But that, there we go. Again, there'll be 10 of these. 1001, 2002, 3003. In fact, let's just make them all zeros, one, 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 one. It'll make it much easier when we're looking them up. And I'll put five of these on each line.
All right, so those are my 10 different employee IDs. OK, then I'm going to put I'm going to put uh, add four more arrays. OK, one is going to have employee first name, then employee last name, then employee pay rate, then employee uh, or employee hours work, then employee pay rate. OK, so we've got our first string that's got employee IDs. We're going to make another string. We're going to call emp first name names and that'll be also equal in here so okay so I've now got a bunch of Bunch of first names. Okay. Ben. Mary. William. Gail. Ron. Gwen. Sally, <clears throat> Mark, Mike, and Sandy, after my wife. All right, so we now have 10 employee first names. After that, I'm going to put 10 employee last names in there. Okay, so Ben is going to be Benj. William will be William Doe. Gail will be Gail. Brown. Ron will be Ron White. There's a comedian named Ron White. Gwen will be Gwen Green. Sally will be Sally Black. Mark will be Mark King. Mike will be Mike Johns, and Sandy will be Sandy Jason. Make all these are made up. So ideally, when we come in and I put in zero 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 for the first name, it's going to bring in Ben. For the last name, it's going to bring in Jones. All right. So we need two more things in here. We're going to assume. Nah, let's not do that. So we'll have another string in here that'll call emp hours. We'll set that equal to. It does that. I don't know. I actually I do know, but. Let's put a little bit of spacing in here, so I can hit enter. And I'm going to hit enter. There we go. All right. So the hours work. We'll just put it all over the place. So this won't be a string. This will be integers. Because it's the number of hours they work. In fact, let's make them decimal. All right, and we'll make it 40M, 37.5M, 55M, 60M. Again, I'm making all these up. 
25 M, that's five. 35 M, 44.5 M, 56 M, 73 M, and 12, let's make it, that'll make it 12 M. So that's the number of hours they worked. And of course, I don't want that there. That's why I'm getting that error. So finally, and don't worry, I'm getting some errors that look like in there, but if I get any, I think they'll work their way out pretty quick. All right, so finally, one last one, and that will be EMP hourly rate. All right. And again, this is how much money they make per hour. That's, uh, these will be changed. So let's put in 10, 12.5, 15, 20. I'm just, like I said, making this up. 25M can stay, 35M can stay. So let's keep all these. Let's add these back and we'll make the, this 22M. 25 M, oops, and finally 19, 19.5 M. All right, so now we've got 10 employees. Each employee has an ID. Each employee has a first name. Each employee has a last name. Each employee has a number of hours they worked. Each employee has an hourly rate. So now I want to be able to look up based on these numbers. And even though I say numbers, they're strings, but based on those employee IDs, what I want to be able to do is if I put in the last one, 9999. This last name field should say Kaysen. The hours work should say 12, and the hourly rate should say 19.5. That's what I want to have happen in here when I click the lookup button. That's the thing that I've been adding in here. Way down on the bottom. Here it is. So I'm going to say attempt to Look up employee by ID. That is a really long name, probably a lot longer than I should have made it, but it's okay. Okay, so this will be a, a private void and it'll be that. So think about this now. When I click look up, first of all, let's see if it's even working. So let's do a show message in here. And I'll have it say in um, attempting to do an employee lookup. Okay, and the title will be attempt the lookup with my semicolons. Let's see if that's working. All right, so when I click this and I click look up, it is saying attempt employee lookup. OK, so that's all working. Good. All right, so. I don't need that anymore, so I can get rid of it. So what's the first thing I want to do? OK, first thing I want to do is I want to check. Check for nothing. Entered. Into employee ID text box. That's the first thing I want to do. OK, so if. What did we call that TXT employee ID dot text? All right, if that's equal to nothing. If there's nothing in there. In fact, we have to do that. Don't we have an is in here?
How about an if not is present? TXT employee ID dot text. OK, well, what doesn't it like? Well, the first thing is if you remember when we did these, we had to use that tag property. Is my tag property set for this stuff? Yep, first name. Yep, last name. Yep, hours worked. Yep, hourly rate. So this one, we're going to add a tag. It's currently got the tag from first name, which I don't want. I'm going to make this employee ID. All right, let's go back to our lookup. So when we call is present, we've got to give it this stuff. We've got that, and then we've got to give it its name and then the name of the control. Okay. That's the name. And we need the name of the tag, which was employee ID. Then we need the name of the control, which is just TXT employee ID. Why is that working? Uh, yeah. So TXT, let's see what we got. There's something in here it doesn't like. All right, I think, let's see, I need another paren here. That did the, the fix part of it, fix one of my errors. And it says this not cannot be put into type string. So let's see, let's look at that. Private string is present, the value. That's my text box, the name. That's the tag name and the name of the control. I thought I had all those. That's exactly how we did it in there, is present. We'll do it like this. So I'm going to say result equal is present, and I'm going to get rid of one of those like that. Still doesn't like it. Cannot implicitly convert type string to bool. Didn't think this would be diff difficult enough. So error message plus equal. Oh, it's returning the string. That's the problem. And I'm trying to put it into a bool. All right. So string, let's call it error message. But equal to the empty string. So we're going to set here error message equal to that. All right, now that works. If error message is not empty,
All right, so this returns. You know, this is going to tell me that, there isn't, that it is a required field. All right. And we're making it required just for what we're doing right now. We could always change this later, so let's see. So if there's nothing in there, it already have given us the message. And what we said was what we wanted to do then was we wanted to call this thing. This clear. And focus correct control. So are we already doing that? Yes. OK. So. If there was an error message, I just going to return. Let's see if that works. Right, I'm putting nothing in the ID. I've got to change my uh, tab order, but I'm going to click now look up. Well, that didn't work the way I wanted it to, so that isn't good. OK. So we call this present. All right. And let's see, is presence going to come up here? And if there was a problem, it's going to say that that's a required field and it's going to re it's going to set that. So let's see. All right. Problem is with my check right here. This this is wrong. So error message equal is present. I just want to see if I remove this. And I run it and I put nothing in there. All right, let's put a. Let's see if it's getting called. So I'm going to go back up. To the is present. Right there. OK, so. I'm in here and I'm not going to put anything in here and I'm going to click look up. All right, it is being called here. OK. If the value is nothing, which it should be, it's according to this, it is. Message. Should be saying that that's a required field and it's returning that so. Do need that. So error message equal that. If it's not empty. I'm going to do a show message and I will put in there the error message and the title will be no employee ID given. Let's see if this works. And then I'll return. All right, I'm putting nothing in the ID and I'm clicking look up. Need that anymore, so let me get rid of that and run it again. Good, no employee ID given. OK, so we find we've got that part done. All right. So like I said, we've got that part done. Return message, yeah, 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 yeah. Let me go back to here and let me reset the tab order. So view. Tab order, I'm going to reset this to zero, one. Two, three, four. Five, six, seven, eight, nine. Ten, eleven, twelve. Thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen. 
19-20-21. Do another view tab order. And let's run it again and see if it comes to the employee ID. It does. If there's nothing in there, we're just saying that the employee ID is a required field and we're done. OK, that's good. So. What that means is if we get down to here. So verify. That an. Employee. ID. How about this employee it verified that something. Was entered into the employee ID text box. All right, so here, this will be the case where nothing was entered. All right, so if I get down to here, something was entered. I get down to here, something was entered into the employee ID text box. All right, just like that. Now, there's different ways that we can do this, okay? I'm trying to figure out in my head right now, I'm, I'm writing this program in my head. So what I'm trying to figure out is if <clears throat> I'm trying to figure out if, okay, so we've got something in there. So we want to test and make sure that it's one of the values that's in there. So So what we want are the contents. We want to check now if it's one of these. All right. Those are our valid employee IDs. OK. So. This is going to look just mighty weird for a while if I'm doing it right. But it actually shouldn't be that hard. I'm going to try to do a switch on the employee. IDs. OK. But I want to. Oh. Maybe it'll be harder than I think. It's not going to like that. Employee IDs. I don't think I'm going to be able to do it like this, but we'll see. All right, so it doesn't like this. So case this. Take that either. All right. What we want to be able to do here is check for 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, et cetera, all of those. So for right now, I'm going to write this. It's going to look a little bit weird, but that's OK. All right, so as I come in here and check, this will be 1, 1, 1, 1, 2, 2, 2, 2, 3, 3, 3, 3, 4, 4, 4, 4. Five, 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 five. 
six, 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 six. Seven, 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 seven. Eight, 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 eight. Zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Ninety-nine, nine, nine, and we'll put in our default break. All right, so it doesn't like these. Okay, I'm I'm going to do this because I want it to work and I don't want to be spending any more time than I have to here. So I'm going to come in here and I've never heard this saying before. I'm going to kind of make what's called a kludge. I'm going to make this work. All right. And I'm going to make it work in a weird way. Okay, so I'm going to say uh, something was entered in there. So I'm going to say ID equals TXE employee ID dot text. OK, and then I'm going to switch on the ID. That should work just fine. So if it is one of these, I'll want to do something. And if it's not, I won't want to do something. Now. Oops. I got zero, one, two, three, four. Five, six, somehow I put that in there again. Seven, eight, nine, and default. Okay. All right. I'm going to write another routine and I'm going to call fill X boxes and I'm going to pass a zero into it. These are these are the array elements. That's array element zero, array element one, array element two, etc. All right. So I'm going to pass in here a zero, a one, a two, a three, a four. A five, six, a seven, and eight, a nine, and in if this, we're just going to put in a show message, and it's going to say employee ID plus plus ID plus not found. And I'll say no employee with ID inputted. OK, believe it or not, it's close. It's fairly close to being done. So let me just grab this. And we're OK up to here. Private void. This is this is going to show us something, not exactly what I wanted to show us, but it'll work. So I'm going to say int employee. All right. So I what I want to do is I want to say txt first name dot text equal employee first names amp let's put these in so first name last name Hours worked. 
wait a minute, something like that. TXT hours worked. What did I call that? Not here. TXT hours worked and TXT hourly rate. Okay. Oh, it is what I call it in the area. Yeah. All right. Amp hours worked. Let's we'll change it to that and amp hourly rate. And this will be hourly rate. All right, now, well, something's goofed up there. So let's, oh, that's going to be another dot to string. Okay, and we'll just make both of these an N2. All right. Now, if this works, you're going to know right away. And if it doesn't, you're going to know right away. How's that? So come up here and let's run it. We'll put in employee 0000, click lookup. And it's Ben Jones, work 40 hours. Okay, let's clear. I didn't clear that. I got to fix that. So if it's one, 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 there's Mary Smith. If it's two, 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 three, it's Gail Brown. I guess you can see that right now it actually is working. All right. I am doing a lookup. One thing I want to do is that clear. I want to clear this out too. So let's go back to our clear. And in here, I want to start with txt employee ID dot text equal nothing and txt employee dot ID focus. All right, now what I want to show you from what we've done here is I want to quickly go over this and then put this to rest for right now. I'm not going to do it with with a collection. All right. Just because I had enough trouble just doing it with an array and I don't want you to see me waste time. All right anymore. So let's talk about what we added. First, let me do a file save all. All right, it's a lot different program this way because if I run it and I don't put anything in the employee ID. Oops. If I don't put anything in the employee ID, I get no employee ID given. If I put something that doesn't exist, I get employee ID not found. And I really should probably be clearing that too, but that's okay. All right. But if I do put in an actual What did I do to make that happen? Let's just go over this. All right. We added the employee ID field. I moved the first name and last name so they were on the same line. I don't think there's any surprises there. OK, but in the lookup routine now attempt to look up employee by ID. So that calls this. All right. Well, first we wanted to see if there was an, a thing present, so I could have come in here. I could have come in here and I could have checked. I could have said if 
uh, txt employee ID dot text equal equal double quote double quote and I could have done this, but we've already got an is present method. So I'm calling the existing is present method and what is it doing? It's the employees. That's the actual field I want to check. That's the tag. That's the name of the control. All right. And if it comes back. And it did give me an error message. I'm just showing it and it's saying show no employee, no employee ID given. So this message that you see way up here. This message right here. Name is what I'm passing in. So this is txt employee ID dot text. This is the tag that's employee ID. This is the name of the control. That's just txt employee ID, not the dot text. So the message that I'm getting when I put in nothing where it says employee ID is a required field is coming from right there. No employee ID given, but that's where it's being set is right here. Where I'm printing it is in my show message. So what I'm saying here is. If. In other words, if there was something in the error message. Then I'm showing what that error message was and saying no employee ID given and returning. So I haven't put anything in. So something was entered in there. So whatever we entered into that employee ID text box, I'm just putting it into ID. All right, now there's a much better way of doing it than this. What I should actually be doing is I should be iterating through the array. I should be going through the array and if it finds it, I should be calling fill text box. So this is that kludge I mentioned I put in. So I have to think about it, but there's a better way of writing it than the way I'm doing it. So if it's zero, 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 I'm calling fill text boxes and pressing in a one, a zero, because that's the zeroth element in the array. One, 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 one is the is that element, etc. And if there's nothing, I'm just calling show message. And I'm saying that it was not found. All right, so I've got a very simple little lookup program here. Is this written well? It could be written a lot better. Okay. And um, we'll, we'll, I'll think about how I can make it better. All right, so it is just about 11 o'clock and I'm going to try to do this and see if I can get it to work. I am going to right now take a break until approximately 1115. All right, I know while that's about 20 minutes, but I want to stop this tape, which is now almost at three hours long. And that's the one I'm going to give out there publicly to everybody in YouTube land. Then I'm going to make a second tape, which will be private, where we go through some of the homework examples that, that you have been given. All right, so as of right now, <clears throat> I am going to stop this tape. I will be back at 1115 and I'm going to put a message out there that says that momentarily.